These movies are a little bit old, um, so they will be spoiler thoughts. Just, just letting you all know. So top 10 lists are fun, except one thing that I've realized is that I've hardly gone to the movie theater in the past two to three years. Uh, I would go religious. You know, actually, I was about to say that I used to go to the movie theaters religiously, but even when I worked at a movie theater, I'd have a hotly anticipated movie for months, and then it'd come, you know, I'd have to work release day. And I'm like, eh, eh. So, Justin, you want to go sit down and watch the movie after your shift? I'm like, meh. Yeah, you know, if it's a Spider-Man movie, I'm there. But I found that there was a large amount of movies that I, I, for some whatever reason, as soon as they were released, I lost all interest in going to go see it. I do not know why. I remember when COVID first hit, right before it hit, uh, the last movie I saw in the movie theater was in Stamford, Connecticut. And I went to go see the Safdie Brothers uh, Uncut Gems. And that was such a high anxiety movie, I couldn't even finish. I had to walk out halfway through. So when they say that I'm a movie lover, I am a movie lover with limits. I am a highly anxious person. And if I'm, I, I think I was a little bit drunk. I'm not going to lie. I think, I think I was a bit hungover watching it. Like I, I was drinking earlier in the day. And my roommates had some of her friends over, and they were watching Harry Potter movies. And I thought to myself, yeah, I'll, 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 let, I'll let her do her thing, and I'll go down the street to go see Uncut Gems. I bring, I bring up that experience because when I think of movie theaters and how small my list is here, I, I, I think I could do better. Hey, let's see. Let's do a little count here. Noteworthy movies since 2021 off the top of my head. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11. 11 or 12. I'm terrible at counting. <laughs> I thought it would be fun to do noteworthy movies. Movies that I liked. Movies that I want to like. And movies that I respect. And movies that I don't like. And at the top of my list is Licorice Pizza. Let's do it. Yeah, licorice pizza. Something tells me this isn't going to be the only time that I talk about licorice pizza. If you ever hear me talking about any two movies on and on and on and you wish I would shut up about them, chances are it's going to be licorice pizza, RRR, and or a Spider-Man movie. Ah, I do have a beard. <laughs> I am a guy. <laughs> and I feel like I, I, I am with... I, I feel like I'm highly recognizable, even though it's not a visual show at this point. <laughs> but I want to get into it. So yeah, Licorice Pizza is a 2021 movie, and it was my favorite movie of the year. I remember when Paul Thomas Anderson's last movie came out, Phantom Thread. It was actually funny. So, so I was one of those college film students that never watched a Paul Thomas Anderson movie. I saw Punch Drunk Love when I was a kid, but it was an Adam Sandler movie, and of course I didn't get that back in the day. And if I did see a PTA movie uh, in the years since, they never really clicked with me, or at least not that I thought. I've seen parts of There Will Be Blood, and honestly, it's not my... that I need to give that movie another shot, or a third or fourth shot. When I first saw Boogie Nights, and I believe I saw Boogie Nights... My senior year of college, I was, yeah, because I was on my off-campus apartment watching it on my tiny TV, and I just remember thinking to myself, two and a half hours later, I'm like, that is my favorite movie I have ever seen. It not it blew my socks off. Um, so much so that, that when Burt Reynolds died about a year later, I was like revving in pain. I was in Newark, New Jersey, reading the news for a film festival, and I was like, oh, no, no. And then Phantom Thread came out. I went to go see it a few months later with my friend. And her and I went to this movie theater about an hour, hour and a half away. And we we're watching Phantom Thread for the first time on this balcony movie theater. It's one of those classic ones that I <laughs> ironically ranted against last show on the Somerville Theater. But this was somewhere else. Irrelevant. If you guys have seen Phantom Thread, there's a twist at the end of the movie. I will not give it away. Um... But needless to say, it was one of my favorite movie-going experiences of my life. Because all of a sudden, we're watching a movie, and the shoe drops, and without like nudging each other or whatnot, my friend and I looked at each other, our jaws dropped. It was phenomenal. And so when Licorice Pizza was coming out, and it was starring this uh, largely unknown to me, 
Alana Haim or Haim, and I apologize. I'll go back and forth pronouncing that last name. Uh, I, I, I didn't know what to expect. I saw the trailers. I was very excited about it. I like sunny movies. I like period pieces and the son of Philip Seymour Hoffman. The character of Gary. I kind of forget his real life name. That's a problem. But definitely check out the movie for those two performances. Obviously, they're what make the movie. But Licorice Pizza blew my mind. And I went to go see it five times in the theater. I went to go see it in 70mm in Boston. I would run out of things to do after work. And I'm like, hey, let's go down to you know next town over and see Licorice Pizza again. It makes me happy. And it's funny because for as much as I say it was my favorite movie of that year, every time I put it on TV because I bought it, I can't finish it. It's like the definition of a big screen movie. It loses some of it, some of its magic when you watch it on the small screen. And so, what else do I want to talk about? Licorice Pizza. I mentioned that it was sunny. I'm, I'm. Uh, when it comes to the cinematography, I don't know. It probably isn't natural lighting, but maybe it is. I just like movies that depict sunny afternoons, sunny mornings. It's just warm and fuzzy. I like to laugh. I like unpredictability. Licorice Pizza has a fantastic box truck sequence. Uh, I was on the edge of my seat, not knowing where it was going to go, as they were uh, out of gas and reversing the truck down a winding L.A. road at night. I don't know. I, you know, I have a list here, but I don't have any thoughts written down. This is just off the top of my head. Licorice Pizza is great. Some people say it's problematic, and I agree. It is problematic. It is problematic. I, you know, I don't even want to get too far into it just because of how problematic people might take it. Uh, for the sense of a lot of Heim's character says that she's 25. Although if you listen to the movie very closely, I am convinced her character herself is lying. And that the character is actually 28 hanging out with a 15 year old. And, you know, subsequently falling in love with a 15-year-old. And I would have liked, you know, I think I would have preferred if there was a time jump by the end of the movie. Um, it's like, okay, maybe the, maybe Gary's a little closer to 18. But for what it was, it was just, you know, the, 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 the chemistry these two actors brought to the table. It was lightning in a bottle for me. And it worked. And I think the whole point of it was, you know, Gary's supposed to be older for his age. And, and he... You know, I don't even want to get into it. I, I, I'll make it. You know, I'll probably come back to this in the future because there's a lot to get into with Licorice Pizza. Um, if you like movies and if you like plots that go a little hard, uh, Licorice Pizza goes really hard. And Bradley Cooper steals the show. <laughs> it's got an all-star cast, and I highly recommend Licorice Pizza, favorite movie of 2021. And the movie I have below Licorice Pizza is another 2021 movie, and it's a Marvel movie. I got a few Marvel movies on this list because they are worth noting because I have some issues with Spider-Man No Way Home. So if you don't want to know anything about Spider-Man No Way Home, skip to whatever timestamp is here, probably, hopefully, fingers crossed. I Sp <laughs> Spider-Man No Way Home is a paradox to me. It somehow is one of the best Spider-Man movies, and it's also simultaneously one of the most frustratingly bad Spider-Man movies. It's not bad. None of it is really bad. The camera work is a bit boring, but they kind of pull an Evil Dead route in the sense of it. The magic is in its editing and pacing, and so I can get away. I can get around a lot of that. Like you know, the characters and dialogue on screen have to pop, and I think they do for the most part. Uh, Willem Dafoe's Green Goblin was the thing that I was really looking forward for. Uh, people hate the Power Rangers suit from the 2002, yeah, 2002 film. I love it. I think it's corny. But, you know, the fact that he doesn't wear the suit in No Way Home, I had to get over it. Now I've made peace with. I like the new design. And, you know, it was never the Green, there was never the Green Goblin Power Ranger suit that was the draw. It was Willem Dafoe. And Willem Dafoe does not disappoint. He never does. I I think it's fun. You get to see... I, I, I'm taking this with somebody else. I, I, I wish I could credit them pers uh, specifically, but I think it's a fact. You're like, oh my goodness, you get to see the performance under the Power Rangers mask, and it's awesome. But my problem with it... Tobey Maguire should have been killed. I don't believe for a second that the Green Goblin stabbing his, of all Spider-Men, 
Spider-Man in the back, that he wouldn't have gone for a kill strike, a killing blow. And I used to say that, oh, people used to say, they would defend it, and they would say, oh, well, Spider-Man has super healing. Spider-Man has super healing, and I'm like, great, where in the movie do the, you know, show that Spider-Man has super healing? And they were like, oh, well, that's just the character, that's just one of his powers. I get that, but where, where's the evidence of it? And to the movie's credit that I uh, found upon a recent rewatch was that Tom Holland's Spider-Man does get shot in the arm. And it's not that big of a deal. But then again, that's an arm thing. But, you know, I don't know. I just, I choose to believe that Willem Dafoe's Green Goblin would have killed Tobey Maguire's Spider-Man. But Marvel probably wanted to do something with the character in the future. I just thought that was an unfair way to mess, manipulate people's emotions at the climax of your movie. At the very least, you could have had Tobey Maguire maybe been in critical condition. It's like, oh, he has to get back, get help. We don't. It's like, oh, we sent everybody home, but we don't know what happened to Tobey Maguire. But it's pretty clear at the end of the movie that he's going to be fine. And I thought that was pretty much a letdown. Oh man, that really bothered me. <laughs> that that that. that. Because Willem Dafoe is like my the Green Goblin is like one of my favorite comic book villains. Uh, well, I don't. I'm not a big comic book guy. Comic book movie villains from that first Spider-Man movie, and his subsequent voice cameos in the other two Raimi films. But I felt like the IP got in the way of the storytelling and the fact that nobody. I haven't seen anybody criticize the movie for this for what they do at the end. They're like, oh, that was great. That was awesome. That was my favorite Spider-Man movie. Great. I'm good. I, I, I'm happy for you. Um, so when did you trade in your storytelling cred- credentials for fun action figures together? You know, I don't know. It just bothered me. There, there are three Spider-Man in that movie. You had room for one to drop. But that's just me. The movie I have below that is a movie that I don't remember that much. I do, I do. I remember enjoying it, and it's Shang-Chi, another Marvel movie. I, I, it's on the list because I want to recommend it, you know? Remember, this is a noteworthy list. It's not my favorites. You know, I have issues with some of these, a lot of these movies. Shang-Chi feels like... If every Marvel movie could be like Shang-Chi and the Ten Rings, I don't think that'd be an issue. I had fun with it. I thought the fight choreography was fun, and people said, oh, the ending was your classic Marvel CG battle, which is true, but there was a dragon. Come on, get over yourselves. We can have fun with a dragon. That's my opinion, at least. Um, And I like the characters. I really like the Mandarin in the movie. I I remember that first shot, one of the most breathtaking shots, and it's from the trailer, is when he meets his, I think, future wife for the first time. And there, are, you know, there's a there's there's a fight scene between them, but it's choreographed like it's a dance, and they fall in love, and it's absolutely gorgeous. Uh, let's see here. I've got a couple more Marvel movies, but let's do Eternals. Eternals, <laughs> Eternals, man, people, peeps. One of the strangest Marvel movies. It doesn't work. I don't know why it had to be two hours and thirty seven minutes, but here we are. But. Again, kind of like Shang-Chi. If if every Marvel movie was sort of like Eternals and Shang-Chi, we wouldn't be complaining. Now, a lot of people don't like Eternals. I don't really like Eternals. A Marvel movie doesn't need to be good. It just needs to feel different and fresh and reinvent itself a little bit. And I think Eternals failed in its reinvention, but it tried. And I'll take an Eternals over a Black Widow any day. And if you're wondering where that Marvel movie is on this list, uh, less said about that one, the better. I have nothing, you know, like I, I, I just so I could talk about Black Widow just for a quick thing because I don't, I, I don't want to lump myself in with those misogynistic assholes out there. I love Scarlett Johansson, Florence Pugh. I just thought Black Widow was just an awful movie. The only thing I remember, for, I, I remember that movie quite a bit, and I did, I wanted to enjoy it, but I made a lot of defense for Marvel movies in the past, and Black Widow was the first time that, like, ooh, I'm starting to see the cracks. And I believe Falcon and Winter Soldier came out first and WandaVision, the, the Marvel TV shows. And that's definitely when you get to see the storytelling cracking a bit, going from episode to episode to fill runtime. But the Marvel movies, especially off of Endgame, Endgame's you know among the best of the genre, lumped in with Infinity War. And yet 
I don't know. Black Widow came. Everyone says Black Widow came five years too late. And it's true. But it's not just that. It's not that it came five years too late. It's that the script was wanting. And I wish it was better. I look I, I look forward to... I don't know. Maybe they'll make a Black Widow 2 with Florence Pugh. And it'll be much better. Ooh, this should be a Hawkeye team-up movie with Haley, St- Haley, Haley Stan- Steinfeld with Florence Pugh. That'd be kick-ass. I would enjoy that quite a bit. If the script was right. Um... <laughs> Oh my goodness, what happened, Black Widow? But Chloe Zhao Eternals, I I wish more Marvel movies felt freshly weird. Suicide Squad, oh, no, 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 not Suicide, THE Suicide Squad, written and directed by James Gunn. That movie blew me away. If Licorice Pizza didn't come out in 2021, Suicide Squad would have taken it for me. It was very close. I don't think it's a perfect movie. I think there are movie I think there are moments in that movie that show fantastic movie magic. Though when I when I say movie magic, I think of the scene with um King Shark and he's in the uh in the tower at the end of towards the end of the movie and he's like in that aquarium room where all of the fish that end up, you know, like piranha fish end up swarming and following him from on the other side of the glass and there's that beautiful music playing and King Shark is giggling and running around and that was wonderful oh my goodness that was movie magic you know it was moments like that that it didn't feel like a studio mandated film it felt like a writer director shining through and James Gunn has issues he's got script issues um, I know he's writing and directing the next Superman. I'm very excited about where he takes things in DC Universe because for all of his faults, I, I'm i praying that there are going to be, I put fingers crossed there, uh, that there'll be more movie magic moments like that of King Shark. Plus, I, I'm a big Doctor Who guy and I like, I like Peter Capaldi. <laughs> I love, yeah. Although my biggest complaint of suicide of the Suicide Squad was James Gunn is known for his his raunchy rated R humor, scripting uh, dialogue, I should say. And you get the king of all swears. You get the, you basically get one of the kings of anyone who's ever sworn ever, in Peter Capaldi. But you instead of hiring him for his Malcolm Tucker, you hire him for more of his the Doctor. And I think he drops like one F-bomb or something. But like, I don't know. I was just hoping for that James Gunn, Peter Capaldi marriage. And you get hints of it, but not quite as much of it as I would have hoped. So Suicide, The Suicide Squad from 2021, highly recommend. Fun time. Below that, I have The Northman, Northman by Robert Eggers. Written and directed by Robert Eggers. <laughs> the Northman um, bombing is pretty indicative of where we are you can make the best move one of the best movies of the year uh, one of the best action movies of the past probably ever honestly and still make back none of your money because you still made a weird ass movie but the northman uh might actually be a perfect movie it's just my it's just not really my cup of tea i like like whenever i think about the northman i go oh that was a good time but i also get this weird pit in my stomach and I've heard this comparison before, and it's pretty it's pretty blunt and in your face. It's pretty much it's pretty much the ending of the, of Star Wars Episode Three, fighting at the base of a volcano, uh, lava everywhere and stuff. But it's more emotionally captivating because it's the revenge story finally coming to its climax. I don't know. The Northman was a fun time. It's definitely worth watching. I definitely think that people should spend money just to support the filmmaker because I believe he's writing and directing the next Nosferatu. That's probably going to do big business. That's going to be his breakthrough hit. Well, The Lighthouse and The Witch were his breakthrough hits. But The Northman, I I, I fear, is going to be shuff- like forgotten and shuffled along among this guy's filmography. Like It'll be discovered and you know among people's favorites. But at the moment, it looks a bit overshadowed. Everything, everywhere, all at once. Last year's Best Picture winner. Directed and written. I, def- I don't know about written by, probably. But definitely directed by the Daniels, who did Swiss Army Man. And I, I wish I could think of their other movies. <laughs> Swiss Army Man was great. It was fun. It went on a little too long. And that was my issue with everything, everywhere, all at once. I I really enjoyed it. 
I think Michelle Yeoh deserved, everyone deserved all the Oscars in that movie. I love the story. I was tearing up towards the end. Um, I was rooting, like, I'm happy Jamie Lee Curtis won the, uh, for Best Supporting Actress, but honestly, I was rooting for Stephanie Hsu. And the fact that most people weren't talking about Stephanie Hsu as a real contender really frustrated me. Because I, when I think of everything everywhere all at once, I think less about Michelle Yeoh and more about Stephanie Hsu. And admittedly, Jamie Lee Curtis. Jamie Lee Curtis did deserve the win. She did. They both deserved it equally. They, they, it's a shame that they were nominated at the same year for the same movie. Because they, they, they deserve that uh, nomination, if not win, equally. Um, but yeah, I don't know. Swiss Army Man had a pacing issue, and I felt like everything everywhere all at once had a pacing issue. Um, where it just kind of kept going on and on. And on like it kind of felt like return of the king in a sense of is the movie over yet no no we got another scene oh and another scene and another scene i you know i feel like i, I remember i said this after i watched the movie it's like if if the movie stopped at a certain moment and you did something untraditional and you put out the movie you know like the final 20 25 minutes like on netflix or something you know just so i could have some spacing between the two Say, oh, I've seen the bulk of the movie. Now after I have, like, you know, like my own, like, cultivated intermission from the ride home from the movie theater, or maybe the next day, I can put on and finish the rest of the movie. And I feel like that would have helped my enjoyment of it more. But, look, it won. It deserves the win. Um, I'm very happy about everything everywhere all at once and everyone involved. Obviously, Ki Kwan... Oh, why did I, why did I start... Why did I begin trying to say his name? I feel I shouldn't be saying names if I can't pronounce them. But the guy who played Short Round in Indiana Jones and was in the Goonies that everyone is in love with, <laughs> and rightfully so, he steal he he does steal the show. And that's hard to do in a movie where they all steal the show. Anyways, everything everywhere all at once, fantastic. Uh, and then below that is the last Marvel movie on my list. And it's Doctor Strange in the Multiverse of Madness. Spoilers, spoilers, and spoilers for Doctor Strange 2. And I really did not like the first Doctor Strange. I That was back when I was like, oh yeah, I like all these Marvel movies and stuff. Again, mind you, I didn't grow up with comic books. I grew up with these movies, more or less. And I enjoyed them and looked forward to them. But Doctor Strange just didn't do it for me. And so I was skeptical of Doctor Strange 2. But what really brought me to the table was the inclusion of the character Wanda Maximoff by portrayed by uh, Elizabeth Olsen but Sam Raimi I grew up on the Sam Raimi movies I remember seeing parts of Spider-Man 2 in the movie theater I remember right after Spider-Man 2 came out and they announced Spider-Man 3 for 2007 and it was still 2004 and I remember thinking oh that's so far away I was like ah 2004 I think I was eight I, I, I'm, I'm a huge Sam Raimi fan. I'm there. You know, I, I just went to go see Evil Dead Rise a few weeks ago. I was there. I, 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 I paid for one film ticket for Evil Dead Rise. I, I know it was written and directed by Lee Cronin, but it's Sam Raimi's franchise. Sam Raimi was coming for Doctor Strange 2. I was skeptical because of the first movie. And after the... <laughs> man, the movie did not get off to a great start. The movie began with... Just a hodgepodge of not very good CG. The worst thing they could have done for marketing was put the Avatar 2 trailer in front of Doctor Strange 2. Because it's like night and day when it comes to special effects and the quality of them. Once once Doctor Strange woke up from his dream and you and, and he goes to uh, he goes to Rachel McAdams character Christine's wedding. You know, he, I, he, this is the moment in the movie that, that won me over. This was the moment. It was when he's getting ready for the, for the movie and he's tying his tie and he uses magic to tie his tie. And I, I thought that was charming. And I'm like, where was any of that in the first Doctor Strange? And then when he's at Christine's wedding and he has to go save the day, you have the cheesy Doctor Strange music start playing. <laughs> and he gets his cape out and he goes saves the day. But I'm also a big Elizabeth Olsen fan. And I know a lot of people don't like this movie and they don't like the script. And I enjoyed WandaVision. But I'll be honest, Doctor Strange 2 gave me everything I wanted out of a Doctor Strange movie. 
I wanted to see the Scarlet Witch. And spoilers, but I wanted to see the Scarlet Witch. I wanted to see her kind of break bad like that. I was that was my that was on my wish list since I finished WandaVision. I'm like, I don't care. If I if I had to go through what this lady has gone through, I would be pissed too. And I, you know, cartoon villain or not, I just don't care. I thought it was done well. I thought she did it. I thought she portrayed the villain well. And I thought the ending was badass. But I loved Zombie Strange. I thought that was brilliant. Oh my goodness, I thought that was brilliant. And people say, oh, it's your, your, your typical CGI end of a Marvel movie. I'm like, are you guys watching the same Marvel movies I'm watching? Doctor Strange inhabited the body of a dead Doctor Strange who was decomposing. And then without throwing a punch, <laughs> saved the day. <laughs> he gave one of those, you have to believe in yourself speeches. That's so cheesy. But for some reason, in this context, I just bought it. Because it was either that or killed a little girl. Uh, uh, not uh, you know The teenage girl, uh, America Chavez. Um, I don't know. I, I loved what I love the scene where he's trying, where, uh, uh, he's fighting the, the, the souls of the damned and he wields them and he fly like, I don't get it. I don't get it. And people are like, oh, it's your typical CGI ending. I'm like, no, it's not. You know, Chavez realizes that she's going to win by giving her exactly what she wants by giving Wanda what she wants. And it's her children and seeing Wanda, scare her children for the monster that she's become it was just beautiful you know look not everything in Doctor Strange 2 works you can definitely see the cracks and the reshoots but just be, and, and look unless I haven't looked at any of the behind the scenes or interviews or any of this stuff so it might come out in the future or already has but my humble opinion just because the studio made Sam Raimi do reshoots doesn't mean that all of a sudden Sam Raimi wasn't the one behind the camera directing the reshoots. And I think that anything directed by Sam Raimi is, you know, probably already better than what we get mostly in, in most other movies. So anyways, I love Doctor Strange too. Good time. Good time. Oh, wait, no, no, no. American Chavez is a little kid. This is the weirdest thing. She's a, she, she, she activates her multiverse hopping powers for the first time by being afraid of a bee that was weird you'd think that the bee would at least sting her but the bee didn't sting her she just saw a flying little bee and it scared her and she screams and then she loses her parents that was I'm like I, like did they run like was that scripted like that couldn't they like did they run out of time to make the bee sting her was that like an like a test audience things like we don't we don't want to show the, the the stinger penetrating any skin it just felt weird that you know without any actual like you know it just felt weird it's a bee what's so scary if the bee stings you yeah scream i get it top gun maverick was editor Ari's favorite movie he saw that movie five times in the theaters i think it was his licorice pizza it didn't strike me as hard as him, but I did enjoy myself. I never saw the first Top Gun. It's not like the movie made me a Top Gun fan, more or less. But I'm a Tom Cruise fan. I love to hate Tom Cruise, but I think I got over that hump when I saw Mission Impossible Fallout. And I really respect Tom Cruise for what he's doing for movies. I mean, outside of, you know, stealing jobs from stuntmen, it is nice to see him doing these insane stunts for the audience. And so it's kind of a double-edged sword, but at least he's doing it at the highest level. You get that. Top Gun Maverick is a fantastic time. It, the most, you know, actually, I know Avatar one, Avatar two won for best special effects, but I would, but like, Top Gun Maverick probably should have been a contender because that's a movie in which they used practical effects and special effects seamlessly. I can't tell the difference. I mean, yeah, Avatar two is gonna win. But they convinced me all the way through in Top Gun Maverick. And so. All right. Now, the, the next movie I got here is In the Heights. I, I was a big Hamilton fan. I remember I, I neglected Hamilton for so long until one day I was in the uh, car with, my two, with two of my friends. And they, they had the whole soundtrack memorized from over the summer. And I remember the song from the soundtrack came on, Satisfied. And they were singing along with it. And I just remember thinking, I was like sandwiched between them. 
or maybe in the back seat and I'm like, God, I feel left out and I'm really vibing with the energy right now. And so from there on out, I became a Hamilton Lin-Manuel Miranda fan. The brilliant thing of the of the Hamilton soundtrack is that you is like it's almost like a it's almost like a bedtime story. You could put it on. I did this once. I put it on as I was going to bed just so that I could you know like oh like like I can close my eyes and imagine the story for itself. The Disney uh, Disney Plus stage play version that they filmed was kind of kind of took some of the magic out of it. But nonetheless, I was very excited for In the Heights, and that movie did not disappoint. Um, that might be a perfect musical, to be honest with you, because In the Heights goes directly up against West Side Story. And I remember this was interesting, too. I'm like, oh, In the Heights. Like, what's what's going to be the better movie of the year? Is it going to be Steven Spielberg's Passion Project and West Side Story, or will it be John Chu? uh Crazy, the guy who directed Crazy Rich Asians. Um, I was very excited for In the Heights and West Side Story. And I'll be honest with you, I saw In the Heights went straight to HBO Max, and it was great. I think I didn't like it as much when I first saw it, but I gained a deeper appreciation for it after I saw Spielberg's West Side Story. Now Spielberg. He, something interesting is going on here. Now, I haven't seen The Fablements. I didn't go see The Fablements because it was over two and a half hours long. And that was pretty much the same length as West Side Story. And I didn't like his West Side Story. I don't really like West Side Story, to be honest with you. Although, when I finally did get to watch the 1960s original, it was fantastic. It did blow me away. When I finally sat my butt down and, you know, gave it the, the attention it deserved, I had no complaints. And yet, there's something wrong with the new West Side Story. It doesn't look right. There's too much green screen, maybe? And again, this could be, you know, this could be a um, COVID-type hit. I did notice that production quality kind of was hindered once, you know, for films that had to be filmed during the height of COVID. Um, I think that you see that a lot in Spider-Man No Way Home. But it really showed through for West Side Story. Because... You had to take a story that I didn't love to begin with. You made it just about the same length as the original. And yet it just it just didn't work. Visually, it didn't work. I don't think I had a problem with the performances. But the visuals really turned me off. And I think when you put West Side Story up against In the Heights, In the Heights, in my opinion, is the is the musical of the year and you know i'm looking at my list right now there's a movie i left i i haven't talked about yet and i'll just close it out uh speaking of straight to hbo max releases godzilla versus kong i've already done a review for godzilla versus kong i reviewed all the godzilla movies in in a in short form fashion and i anticipate reviewing all of them again but in more depth uh, in the future, hopefully more near future than later future. But Godzilla vs. Kong is definitely a noteworthy release. Uh, it's probably the only movie on this list I regret not seeing on, in the movie theater. If I haven't seen, like, all these movies I either saw when, you know, on TV or in the theaters, but if there's any movie that I saw only on TV and wish I went out to the movie theaters, it was, it was GV. It was Godzilla vs. Kong, GVK. Oh man, that movie is not perfect. That movie is very dumb, and yet for my money, it's it's either the best or second best or tied for best of of all the MonsterVerse legendary movies. It's just fun. The smartest thing Godzilla vs Kong does is that it's lean and mean. It's under two hours, and they know it. You get everything you want, and the human stuff isn't the best, but it's also it's all it's it's not lopsided i feel like a lot of these monster verse movies are lopsided they keep cutting like it's a, <laughs> that was the big that was the big complaint from 2014's godzilla too many uninteresting humans too little monster action 2019's king of the monsters i feel like you know almost trolls the audience because the <laughs> I just remember, oh my god, we get this great wide shot of Godzilla and King Ghidorah, I believe, or two giant monsters fighting. You're like, yes! You know, it was already obscured in darkness and cloud and hurricane and rain, but still, it was cool visual-wise. And then all of a sudden, 
lowering into the into the wide shot frame is this huge ass military aircraft and i'm like that's a direct f you to the audience i i i enjoy that quite a bit i thought that was very funny um but yeah okay so let's just you know noteworthy movies that i just talked about um for better or for worse Licorice Pizza, Spider-Man No Way Home, Shang-Chi and the Ten Rings, Godzilla vs. Kong, Eternals, The Suicide Squad, The Northmen, Everything Everywhere All at Once, Doctor Strange in the Multiverse of Madness, In the Heights, Top Gun Maverick, and Steven Spielberg's West Side Story. I hope this is... Yeah, maybe not as entertaining, you know, maybe not as funny, but I hope it's been coherent enough and if you just need to put something on to drone on to, I hope that uh, you enjoyed yourself for 42 minutes. All right. My name is Justin Murray. I do have a Patreon, although there's not too much on there. And when I say not too much, I mean there's nothing on there. But we will be working on that. But if you want to go and support, like, subscribe. I can't believe I'm going to start saying that. But please, you know, if you do, li- if you do like what you hear or see, like and subscribe. And if you want to throw us a few bucks, you can go find us on Patreon and help us out. But I hope to be putting out more content soon. And uh, I guess I'll talk to you all. I guess I'll, uh, I guess, uh, bye.